Thank you. Good afternoon, folks. So we're here to talk about the lost art of software design. And as you know, back in 2001, the Agile Manifesto was created. And since then, and especially in the past decade, I've witnessed many organizations throwing away big design up front. Good thing. Happy with that. However, they've also started to throw away things like architectural thinking and doing documentation. Is that ringing a few bells? Yeah. Uh, diagramming and modeling. As Dave Thomas once said, big design up front is dumb, doing no design up front is even dumber. And this is really the extreme thing. You know, we've gone from one extreme sometimes to the complete opposite. For those of you who went to James Shaw's talk this morning, he spoke about evolutionary design. And that's really the approach that many, team, uh, many teams take these days. It's let's evolve the design as we progress, as we learn things, as we get feedback. And that's fine and that's good and you should definitely do that. However, I think there's still some room for some more stuff to happen. When I talk about design, I want to caveat this, I'm talking about technical design. So not product design. So A-B testing, UX, UI, wireframing, customer stakeholder interviews, all that stuff, definitely do that. That's not what I'm here to talk about. I'm here to talk about the technical aspects of design. And most of this stuff is related to modularity, cross-cutting concerns, technology choices, and so on. You've probably seen this a million times. It's all about minimum viable product, delivering something, getting some feedback. This is a fantastic way to do product design. So you want to transfer somebody from A to B, don't wait five years to make them a car, give them a skateboard. It's very quick and then we can get feedback and iterate. And we can learn and that's good. So that, this is a great way to describe how to do product design. It's not a very good way to describe how to do technical design. Because unfortunately, as you see here, every iteration is a complete re-engineering effort. And that's what we don't talk about. We don't just go build the car. We still need to do some design here. You see in the owl cartoon, it's the same thing. How do you draw an owl? Draw two circles and draw the rest. Or as we like to do with our software systems, it'll be fine this time, I'm sure. Oh no, guess what we did, microservices. <laughs> Thank you. That did not work in Sydney. So my goals for this session. So I'm, I'm going to set my stall out, and I'm going to tell you where we're going. My goals are to explain why I think we need to do some, I'm going to repeat that word, some upfront design and some upfront thinking. And I want to give you some tips and techniques and practices on how we can do this on our teams. So my, my basic end goal here is some design upfront with evolutionary design as we go along. So that's it, now we're done, talk's done. If you want to know more about how we do this and how I got to this point, uh, we can stay for the next 35 minutes. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Simon Brown. I'm an independent consultant specializing in software architecture. Yes, I do work with organizations around the world and make their ugly diagrams look nice. Uh, that's kind of the thing I'm known for. Uh, author of a bunch of books. I also have another hat. So I still write code, I still do the architecture thing, and I have another business called Structurizer, and it's a software architecture documentation tool set. It's all been built myself from scratch, it's all running on the cloud, blah, blah, blah. The techniques I'm about to share with you, I've used uh, building this product, and again, it was some design up front and evolutionary design, and we've progressed. For those of you who came to James to talk this morning, James spoke about switching out the authentication mechanism, so I've done similar things. So I've, I've changed my credit card processor, for example. Back to hat number one. So I'm really lucky in that I get to fly around the world. I've visited over 30 countries in the past seven or eight years, and I work with organizations to teach them software design and software architecture. And these are organizations you've never heard of through to companies you will definitely have heard of. And one of the things I do here is I run architecture carters. And I give groups of about two or three people a set of requirements. And it's a nice, simple set of requirements here for a financial risk system. And I say, what I'd like you to do is to go away for like 60 or 90 minutes, do some design, and draw some diagrams to describe your solution. And that's it, it's kind of vague. And there are two iterations. During iteration number one, we get some interesting looking diagrams, uh, like that, or that. This is what I call boxes and no lines, for obvious reasons. 
this one here is just a list of stuff. This is my favorite. That's uh, Singapore or Hong Kong. Go anywhere from those places. UI upside down. This one's super common. Look, business logic, generic business logic. No tech choices. Bunch of C sharp things floating around a database for some reason. Adventure game. Be careful. All paths lead to the trap. Stormtroopers. Faceless clones attacking the reporting service. And a mess. And I have gigabytes of photos like this at home uh, from iteration one of these workshops. Now, something I do, well, first of all, people think they're going to present their diagrams, and often that's why they don't put much thought into everything, essentially. And one of the things I do is I get groups to switch diagrams and review another group's pictures. And we do something called the perfection game. And this is basically write a list of things you like, write a list of things you don't like and you think could be improved, and give me a score between 1 and 10. Now, the diagrams I've just shown you are kind of extreme. So these are some real diagrams from a real architecture workshop I did earlier this year. Shout me out some numbers. What sort of score do you think this got? Six? Seven? Yeah, this got seven. This one? Five? Also seven. This one? Seven. <laughs> you got it. Seven. Seven. Eight. Nope, seven. <laughs> Play the game. This one? No, six. Now, arguably, this is the most detailed of all of the diagrams. And I think the detail kind of scare people. They're like, oh, that's too complicated. This kind of varies country to country and culture to culture. And it varies from public courses to private courses. But mostly, we get scores around the 7 out of 10 mark. If you were to ask me how much I would rate these, I'd like go two, three, or four. And one of the problems here is many people don't realize that this stuff can be improved. So we do a bunch of stuff on the workshops, and we get to iteration two. And guess what? Iteration two looks nicer. Hooray. Now, my workshop's not a drawing workshop. And it just happens I've picked a really nice example of a really well-drawn picture. But there's a lot more to unpack here. And that's really what this talk is all about. So let's dive into this. Upfront design is the first thing I want to talk about explicitly. During my travels, I have been given every excuse you can possibly imagine for why teams should not do upfront design. Here are some of my favorites. Are we allowed to do upfront design? I've literally had teams say this to me. I'm like, oh, wow, I'm so sorry. We don't do upfront design because we do XP. I'm not sure that's what XP says. We're agile, obviously. <laughs> it's not expected in agile. Yeah, that's quite common. Where does, where does this come from? It comes from all the literature about agile. You know, you go read the literature, it says, there is no big design up front, but people miss out the word big, and they go, oh, great, we don't need to do design now. Uh, you go read some other stuff, and it's like, yeah, some of the more extreme XPs are putting effort into not doing architecture stuff up front and doing technology deferral and decoupling and stuff. And the thing here, of course, is that although these luminaries in Agile are not explicitly telling us to not do design, we often make an assumption that that's what's being said here because the literature doesn't explicitly mention upfront design. So you have to watch out for this. And you have to watch out for this in conference talks as well. You know, just because the speaker's on stage talking for like half an hour or something, they're not going to say a bunch of stuff. That doesn't mean it's not important. Someone actually said this to me once. So I'm here talking about upfront design and waving my arms around, and like, I bet you're not a programmer. This is borderline offensive. I, I let them off. Um, but yeah, I, I, I do this. I have a business, and it's code and stuff. So yeah, I, 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 I kind of definitely know how this works. One thing to bear in mind here is that the people who put together the Agile Manifesto all those years ago have a ton of experience, like a lot of experience. And we don't likely have that same level of experience. 
if you look around, most teams now, they're staffed with you know, relatively young people. As a thought experiment, I kind of wondered my, to myself, if we took these super experienced agile people out of software and put them into a world they're not familiar with, would they still talk about doing, you know, just experiment and refactor? Well, this happened on Twitter a while back. So Kent Beck is like, I've got some time off, I'm gonna write a book. Here's my outline for my book, and the photo's upside down, I, I don't know why, um, but whatever. And you know what's coming next, don't you? Somebody replied to his tweet and said, well, why have you done an outline? Why are you not just writing and refactoring as you go along? And his response was, I want to do it to reduce my anxiety. That's, that makes sense. And that's why I do upfront design. I want to do upfront design because I want to reduce my anxiety. Because I'm not an expert. You know, I've got 20 years experience or something, but I'm not an expert. And there's still stuff I don't know. And, and that's really the whole point of this. And the whole agile thing requires a toolbox of techniques and practices. And I think, tragically, as an industry, we've stopped teaching a lot of this stuff. And you can see this. If you go and ask people on your team, how do you design software? They'll stumble around for a bit and they'll say, well, um, yeah, we use a whiteboard. Right. Do you get code off a whiteboard? You know, what are you using the whiteboard for? And they'll say, well, we're drawing pictures, boxes and lines. And then you have this whole conversation. Well, what are your boxes and lines? What are your boxes? And they say, the boxes are components. I have a whole talk on that and why it's bad. Ultimately, you get to this. We use our experience. And this is kind of what we do, but it's not a great way to describe and articulate how we do software design. Imagine I'm at the whiteboard drawing a bunch of boxes and I've got a, a fresh out of university apprentice working with me with no experience. And I'm there drawing three boxes and my apprentice says, Simon, why did you draw three boxes and not two or four? And I say, I'm using my experience and we just carry on. That's not a great way to teach people how to do design and kind of what the stuff is my mind is. And there's a whole bunch of literature out there. You know, there's a whole bunch of knowledge around decomposition techniques and modularity and the importance of modularity and some workshop techniques like CRC. And we don't teach people this stuff. I think many people have the wrong view of upfront design. I think, you know, from the bad old days, it was like, let's create a blueprint and we'll fix it and we'll go there. And I think. We're not trying to do that so much anymore. I don't think we're trying to get the perfect end state architecture. This is a better cartoon that talks about evolutionary design. It's by Josh Kurievsky. Beginning with a primitive hole. You want to build an all singing, all dancing guitar that sounds beautiful. You don't spend years creating this thing. You release a first version with two strings. It sounds horrible but you get some feedback. And then you add features, you iterate. And we know this, right? We've been talking about this for decades. The thing nobody talks about is you have to do design to get version one. You have to put some foundations in place to give you a sufficient starting point to iterate and evolve on top of. And that's what we're missing here. The Agile Manifesto, the, the principles page, which really should be the front page, but that's a different story, it talks about design and architecture, and it says continuous attention to technical excellence and good design enhances agility. This is evolutionary design. This is what James was talking about this morning. We're doing simple design. We're doing reflective design. We're, we're looking for feedback, and we're changing and improving stuff. We're inspecting and adapting. A good architecture gives you agility. If you have a rat's nest of stuff, whether it's in a monolith or a set of microservices, you change stuff here, all this stuff breaks, and you don't know why. If you have a good architecture, and for me that's about modularity and structure, it's easy to work with. And that kind of feels right from a gut feel perspective. You'll hear lots of people talk about this, evolutionary architecture, some great stuff in this book, fitness functions, continually assuring and asserting. Things like qualities, uh, Todd talked about this before, and how scaling and security and performance are super important. 
One of the things we don't often consider is that sometimes when you are creating an architecture to be evolvable, you're still making significant decisions. So for example, if you have a whole bunch of people and you say, right, we don't want to choose a single programming language that all of our teams are going to use, so we'll have a microservices architecture. So your microservices architecture gives you flexibility and scalability and agility, but the significant decision you just made was to distribute your stuff. If you're going to build a monolith and you say, right, we're going to build a Java monolith based upon the ports and adapters pattern, guess what? Forevermore, you have a Java monolith. And some people rush into this and not realize that they're actually making significant decisions. So I want to do enough upfront design, enough upfront thinking to put a starting point in place and set a general direction. Maybe not the perfect direction, maybe not the final direction, but at least some vague notion of direction that we as a team can then follow. One of the other reasons we do this is to uncover unknown unknowns. I often see teams kind of rush into stuff and they forget about some of the really obvious things that they should really think about. And I'll talk some more about that stuff later. So I think there's a huge value add in that starting point here. And really, this is just about technical leadership. You know, that's essentially why we're doing this. We're trying to provide some guidance, some technical vision, some technical leadership for our teams to work with. Notice I said work with, not necessarily follow. So go on then, let's talk about diagrams. Let's talk about incomprehensible software architecture diagrams. Who here uses UML? Quick show of hands. I'm gonna guess that's like 20 people, which in this audience is a very small percentage. So again, I've been given a whole bunch of reasons from teams around the world as to why they don't use UML. Here are some of them. I don't know it, right, so that's applicable for a bunch of people here. Not everybody on the team knows it, same thing. I'm the only person on the team knows it. But now if I ask this question, it's a really small percentage. There are two exceptions. I hope I don't offend anybody. The Netherlands and Germany. <laughs> the percentage is maybe 20%. So it's not even that much higher. Uh, you'll be seen as old for something somebody said to me recently. I'm like, whoa, hang on a second. I've got gray hair. I'm feeling offended again. This is shortly followed up by you'll be seen as old fashioned. <laughs> this company, very well known, I think has some, some cultural issues. Um, I'm not sure. We don't want to tell developers what to do was an interesting one I heard recently. Again, there's this perception that just because you draw UML diagrams, that has somehow coupled to ivory tower dictatorship. And of course that's nonsense, you know, just because you're using a standard set of boxes and lines doesn't mean you're telling developers what to do. Yes, the tooling does suck, <laughs> has done forever. Uh, UML is too detailed, that's true. It's very low level, very precise. You draw a, a class diagram on a whiteboard, you spend endless numbers of minutes describing what the black diamond versus the white diamond is, and nobody ends up knowing. You have to go to Wikipedia, do the car, whole car has wheels thing. It's a very elaborate waste of time. Now, no one's actually said this to me in person, but he has on the internet. So this begs the question, what's the answer? Like, what's the general recommendation if we think all of this UML stuff is a waste of time? Just use a whiteboard. No, I know how this works. Really badly, like really badly. I've got gigabytes of photos like this and worse. So this whole just use a whiteboard thing, it's not particularly sufficient. So go on then, what's wrong with these diagrams? I imagine there's a bunch of people sitting in the audience going, well, they're okay. They're like the ones we have on our wall. <laughs> Hold that thought. One of the things I do again is I get groups to swap diagrams. And I say, right, don't focus on the, the notation and the boxes and lines and all that stuff. Focus on these two questions. So do you think the solution satisfies the requirements and the architecture drivers? And if you were the bank in this case, would you buy that solution? And after about 10 minutes, people say, we can't answer those questions. And that's pretty obvious when you think about it. The reason the groups can't answer these questions is because they can't see the solution. Right? The solution is just completely obscured by this horrible random notation. 
And if you can't see the solution, you can't understand it. And if you can't understand it, you can't evaluate it. It's not expecting the Agile as another reason. Yeah, this is a common theme, isn't it? Why not? Again, you read around some of the literature around Agile. W would it be better if we used a case tool to lay out our design? No, just use a bar napkin. <laughs> you probably don't need UML in your co-located whole team. Just have a conversation. And this is something else I hear a lot. This is probably the main thing I hear, the, the main uh, kind of objection to not using formal diagramming techniques and just to do stuff on a whiteboard. You know, just have a conversation. The value is in the conversation. And when the conversation's finished, erase the diagrams, we're done. Sometimes if you're really unlucky, photo, stick on confluence. And then it's incomprehensible forever. <laughs> yeah. Someone said this to me once. Uh, all the diagrams you've shown, all the horrible diagrams you've shown are excellent, provided there's conversation. I get that, and there is some degree of truth in that, but if you're having the wrong conversations, all bets are off. And that's the thing here, the value is in the conversation only works if you're having the right types of conversations. And if you can't see the solution and you can't understand the solution, you can't have the right conversations. And I've been in meetings where people have been describing the same diagram from totally different angles and they've got totally different interpretations of what's going on here. Why does this happen? It happens because many groups are just doing very high level, quick and superficial upfront design. And again, I've heard a bunch of interesting stories and anecdotes and, and excuses given to me over the years. What programming language should we use is probably a good question to ask when you're doing upfront design, but it seems many people don't do that. And I've witnessed people looking at architecture diagrams and they don't have tech choices, and you'll have conversations like this. I didn't realize we were building a Python thing. I was like, yeah. Is it not obvious? No, because I'm a Java developer. Well, I'm a Python developer. So, we have a bunch of diagrams and they don't have tech choices and we see the solutions through our eyes. If we're a Java developer, it's a Java solution. I see lots of people drawing diagrams and it's just a bunch of boxes with lines between them and many people think it's a microservices architecture. And sometimes it is, but sometimes it's a monolith. And again, people are drawing these diagrams, you have these logical, conceptual, fluffy components, and we're not talking about basic things like is it a single deployment unit or a, a multiple set, uh, set of deployment units. <laughs> right? We think database. And then somebody will say, I didn't think we were using a database. We're not. Just because it's a cylinder doesn't mean it's a database. By the way, I get a lot of people tell me that the, the, the cylinder shape is a standard UML symbol, which I don't think it is. Why is the ORM directly connected to the Angular front end? This is a bit of a specific one, but if I go back to one of the diagrams from earlier, we have an Angular front end up here with a bunch of stuff. This is a .NET backend, and there is an entity framework ORM there. If you look carefully, there's an arrow going from the ORM in .NET up to a thing in Angular. I'm like, cool. How do you do that? Like, I'm a developer, but I, I don't know how to do that. Similarly, uh, is the web UI getting data from Amazon S3? I saw a diagram a few months ago, and this group drew a, a box labeled web UI and another box labeled S3 and an arrow going from the web UI to S3. I'm like, great, I get that. So then I asked the group, what's your web UI? Is it server-side or client-side? And they said, it's client-side. Uh, and I said, what, running in the browser? Like, yep. Angular? Of course. And I said, so how are you talking to S3 from your Angular app running in the browser? And they said, well, there's a JavaScript API, a JavaScript library. Uh-huh, right. And where are you storing your secrets? <laughs> like, oh, yeah, in the page content. That's not good, is it? No. And again, people are not thinking through some of the trade-offs of their decisions, and this stuff is just not implementable, of course. We're not engaging. Many times I see people do my architecture workshops and carters, they're just rushing into a solution. In the most extreme cases, people are literally drawing a single box with the name of the system, and like, we're done, we're agile. In other cases, seriously, and then you have to do the whole convincing, you should do some more design. 
In other cases, we get diagrams like this. They're very high level, they're very superficial, and they're just named boxes. So in this particular set of requirements, we've got like an audit requirement and a data import thing and a calculation thing, and you'll see those names on these boxes. And that's it. We're like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to stop. And we're not thinking through. We're not getting to an actual solution here. You've seen the S curve for learning before. You start very slow. And at some point, after a little bit of thinking, you get some quite accelerated learning. And eventually, you don't learn so much anymore. I see teams getting stuck here, and they think that's enough. And if you go a little bit further, you learn quite a lot very quickly. Of course, a big design up front is this. Um, we don't want to go there. But there's some interesting point here, some sweet spot here I think we should get to. A friend of mine, George Fairbanks, has a fantastic book about software architecture. It's called Just Enough Software Architecture. And he says this, a good architecture rarely happens through architecture in different design. This is basically jumping up on a solution because of hype, trend, fashion, or just because that's what we always do. And again, it's about not thinking through trade-offs. And that's why, in the industry, we always do this horrible monolith versus microservices comparison. Everybody tries to jump to microservices because they think it's going to solve all of their problems. It's very hype-driven. We all know what happens here. They get that instead. And really, they should be getting that. <laughs> um, I have a talk online you can find from a previous go-to conference called Modular Monoliths. It turns out that even when you figure out how you want to structure your, your code in your monolith, you still have to get the implementation techniques correct. Otherwise, you just end up with basically a mess. Tech decisions. People seem very hesitant to choose technologies during my workshops because of reasons like this. We don't have enough detail. Like, ask me. I'm here. There's, there's no reason that you should not have enough detail. We don't solutionize. We don't solutionize this early. And my personal favorite, our architects are not allowed to do solutioneering. <laughs> yeah, hmm. I thought the whole point of doing architecture and design was to come up with a solution. So therefore, if your architects are not coming up with solutions, what are they doing? Oh, I know what they're doing. They're drawing pictures of clouds with a narrative data store. Just make that happen. I do enterprise things. I don't know how to do that. Nobody actually says this to me. But sometimes there are people out there, and they just generally don't know how to do design. They don't know how to evaluate trade-offs and choose technologies. And, and that's fine. We can teach them. I don't want to impose a solution upon my development team, so therefore, I'm not going to choose technologies. Again, something we used to see in the battle days, ivory tower architecture, was like, the architect said, we must use this set of stuff. And I think that's clouded people's judgment. I think there are times when one or more people, I have to be careful how I phrase this, one or more people in an architecture role might want to choose some technologies to provide some vision and guidance to stop teams choosing anything they like. So there's an interesting conversation sometimes here to be had uh, regarding autonomy versus constraints and standardization. And different companies are on different parts of that spectrum. So it's not an easy thing, this. We leave developers to choose the implementation details. Same thing. Uh, the, team should choose the, uh, the team should choose the implementation strategy. Sometimes I see people doing design, and they're like, of course it's a Java solution, because we're a Java team. It's like, well, it's not obvious to me. And because you've not put tech choices on the diagrams, we can't have that conversation. And one of the things I've noticed over the years is that people drawing diagrams and doing design are very hesitant to put tech choices on these things. But when we're reading diagrams, we really wish they had tech choices on there. So you get this interesting conflict between producer and consumer. So how much upfront design am I advocating here? Obviously some, because I told you that about 30 seconds into the talk. I like to frame this uh, using a pair of questions. Question number one, is that what we're going to build? And question number two, is it going to work? So when you're doing some design and drawing some whiteboard pictures, hopefully nice ones, of course, you need to be able to answer these two basic questions. We're not trying to decide everything. So back like 20 years ago, we would sit down and draw class diagrams for the whole system and figure out database schemas for the whole system, and that's just a waste of time. 
So we're not trying to decide everything, we're trying to decide something else, a smaller subset. Grady Booch, co-creator of UML, he says this, architecture represents significant decisions where significance is measured by cost of change. And this is a really nice way to frame and think about architecture and what it really means. So there's some stuff that's really hard to change once you've made that choice, and some stuff that isn't. What am I talking about here? It's choice of language. So if you look at the systems you are currently building and looking after, if you have a C-sharp app, you can't just change it to be Ruby or something. Right, so somebody made that decision and you stuck with it. If you have a monolith, you're stuck with it. Tearing apart a monolith is hard to do. If you have a distributed architecture, pushing all that stuff back together is hard to do. It's a complete re-engineering effort. There's also things like frameworks and APIs and technologies and stuff like that that become embedded in our code bases. You might be thinking, well, hang on, we do the hexangle architecture thing here, or the ports and adapters architecture. And we have this clean business stuff in the middle, and we defer and decouple all of our tech choices. Yes, that's good, but the significant decision you just made was around structure. You have a more complicated structure to give you flexibility. So again, there are always significant decisions here. Some are more obvious than others. I don't care about this, right? Have all the religious wars you want. I don't care about tabs versus white spaces. Just choose one. Martin Fowler said this years ago, right? There's nothing new here. Martin Fowler said, I think there's a role for a broad starting point architecture, like how you're going to do layering, so how you're going to structure your code, and if you're going to use a web server and a database and that sort of thing. So that's why I'm a little hesitant in recommending the just use a whiteboard, the value is in the conversation thing. Because we need to have better diagrams to facilitate better conversations. And so at this point, some people say, well, hang on a second, this is a bit unfair because your poor workshop attendees only have like an hour and a half, and you're forcing these poor people to use pen and paper, and that's not an optimal medium. Right, so. I've tried adding more time, guess what, same results. I've tried using tooling, guess what, same results. <laughs> right, if you go to Google and you do a search for architecture diagram, you get the same stuff. All of these diagrams look nice, but they have the same problems. Boxes, no lines, unlabeled arrows, acronyms, different sizes, different colors, we have no idea why. The problem is we don't have a good way to describe stuff. Imagine we were building architects and somebody asked us to draw a diagram to describe where we live. We go, yeah, I can do that. <laughs> layering, other layering, random grouping, red dots for Wi-Fi hotspots, because that's important to me. Water in my lounge, it's just all bad. Like, this, this should be a set of blueprints. We can't answer that first question. If we can't describe, if we can't visualize what it is we want to build or want to change or have, we have no chance in, asking, uh, in answering that first question. And we need a ubiquitous language. And I'm not talking about a DDD, a domain-driven design ubiquitous language. I'm talking about some way to have a common set of abstractions that we, as software people, can use to describe architecture, essentially. And the way I do this is I think about software systems as being made up of one or more containers, not Docker. Apologies. I got there first. Ask me afterwards. Containers are just apps and data stores, like mobile apps, web apps, client-side apps, server-side apps, whatever. Containers contain components, and components are built from code. So this is the set of abstractions I use to describe my software systems. And it's super simple, and it's only four levels, but you can use this to describe actually most stuff. Once you have a common language within your teams, you can then draw some diagrams. And the thing I'm known for is called the C4 model. And the C4 model is, it stands for context, containers, components, and code. And it's basically a set of hierarchical diagrams that allow you to tell different stories to different audiences. You can go to c4model.com for more info. It's a set of maps essentially sitting on top of your code base. So I live in Jersey. So if you open up your uh, Google Maps on your smartphone and you do a search for Jersey, the original OG Jersey, not the newfangled New Jersey, this is basically like Australia, by the way. It's just smaller, colder, and we don't have animals that kill you, but basically like Australia. So you get that map by default. If you want to know what's inside Jersey, great. If you've never heard of it, useless. Zoom out. If you want to get more information, zoom in Street View. It's the same thing with a diagram. Sometimes you want to provide an overview for people, and sometimes you want some zoomed in detail. 
It's notation independent, so I'm not kind of forcing a standard notation. It's a notation independent uh, set of diagramming techniques, and you can use UML if you want to. Just because somebody's going to write this down in the notes, although C4 has the number four in the name, please don't do level four. Right? It's there for completeness, but please don't do it. It's way too much detail. There is a notation checklist I've created on c4model.com. There's a handy dandy QR code there. And even if you're not using my abstractions and my diagram technique, you can apply this to any diagram you draw in the future, and it'll hopefully give you some tips on how you can make it better and more comprehensible. And the reason I put so much focus on diagramming is because, well, one, I like it. And uh, two, I think diagrams are underrated and actually super useful. And for me, they form the core of my architecture processes and my architecture practices. And one of the things I use diagrams for is a visual checklist. So I can think through a bunch of things and answer a bunch of questions. So the top level diagram in my C4 model is called a system context diagram. The system context diagram shows two things fundamentally, people, be it actors, roles, personas, or real people, and software systems, so the thing we're building and other systems we integrate with. In order to draw that very simple high-level diagram, you need to ask these types of questions. So what's the scope of the thing we're building? Who's using it? What they're doing? And what system integrations do we need to support? And you can do this really early. Even if you're doing the agile thing and experimenting and getting feedback, you can do this sort of thing quite early, very, very quickly. And you get, especially if you draw nicely, a diagram like this. So this is from a workshop. This is the software system that the group was designing. They've identified a couple of different user types and a bunch of software systems that it integrates with. And we've got lots of text on there, and the lines are annotated, and so on and so forth. And it's just a nice starting point for lots of other conversations. Once we get down a bit deeper, we need to have some tech choices made. We need to figure out what our overall structure is, and modularity, and things like this. And that's what I call a container diagram. And a container diagram basically shows separately deployable things, like apps and data stores. And again, in, in order to draw this diagram, you need to ask a bunch of questions like, what are the major tech choices we're going to make? What are their responsibilities? Uh, and how do these things communicate at runtime? And again, if you draw nicely, you get a diagram like this. So this is one of the solutions from a workshop. And we can see that, again, we have the couple of users. Got a couple of web apps up here. We've got some data stores, a risk cruncher. I love that. Um, and some Java apps, and you can see how they're communicating and so on, and it's nice. These diagrams, the whole purpose of these diagrams is to spark good, meaningful questions. So what normally happens when people draw their diagrams during iteration one is we have a whole bunch of questions like this. Like, what's the red box? What's the blue box? What's the different symbol? What's the line mean? All of these are nonsense, this noise. When you're looking at a diagram, you should not be asking these questions. That should be taken care of by the notation and the techniques that you're using. I want people, when they're looking at diagrams, to ask these questions instead. I see you've got two Java apps. How are they talking to one another? Who's initiating this thing here? You've got two data schemas. Are they really one, or should they be two? Why have you got Postgres and not MySQL? So these are the types of questions I really want developers and architects and operations staff and infrastructure staff and support staff to be asking about the solutions and the architectures. There's a really nice side effect here. So once we go through the diagramming thing in iteration two, one of the things I notice in the groups is they're having much, much richer design discussions. So during iteration one, it's like, oh, we're going to draw a bunch of boxes. Yeah, that kind of looks right. In the afternoon, because the diagrams are encouraging more detail, they're having to ask much better questions. Like, how does this thing talk to this thing? What's the payload? What's the protocol? And so on and so forth. And that's fantastic. Because my, my, my workshop, my carta, is really a diagramming exercise, but it's really about design. It's about doing design quickly and efficiently and well. And of course, when you're making decisions, write stuff down. You might have seen this a few times already. If not, you certainly will. Architecture decision records. So go write down your major decisions. I often get groups to do this during my workshop. And again, they're often making decisions unconsciously. 
So I'm like, write down your top three decisions, and they forget a bunch, about a bunch of really obvious things. So this is actually harder to do than it seems. The diagrams are also meaningful feedback. I often get a group saying, OK, we're doing a service thing. We have a bunch of microservices. And we're finding creating a diagram of all of these microservices is hard. How do we make this easier? Do you know the answer? Simplify your architecture. <laughs> That's it. Don't try and cheat the system. If you have a complicated architecture, your diagram is going to be complicated to reflect that. And that's good. It's feedback. So we can answer that, one, that first question. There's a little tiny bit more work to do to answer number two. Scott Ambler said this years ago. Again, same thing. Base your architecture on your requirements. Travel light and prove your architecture with concrete experiments. And one of the things I encourage people to do is to identify and mitigate their highest priority risks. There's a whole bunch of stuff wrapped up in this, but risks are very subjective, the same thing as estimates. You know, if you're designing a solution, how long is it going to take to build? Every, everybody has their own ideas and opinions. And one of the ways we remove the subjectivity from estimating is planning poker. So I have a technique, and you can find this in my book, it's called risk storming. And it's a great collaborative visual technique for identifying risk. Three basic steps. Step number one, draw pictures. Great. Step number two, get a bunch of people together who might have an interest in what you're building. Developers, architects, operations staff, um, SREs, support maintenance, etc. Get to look at the diagrams and, and say, what do you perceive as being risky with this new thing or thing we're going to change? Give them a bunch of sticky notes, different colors. Pink for high priority risks, yellow for medium, green for low. You have a little time box exercise where everybody's writing ideas on sticky notes and keeping them to the self. So we're removing the anchoring bias. And then we say, time's up. Go stick your sticky notes on the pictures. And this gives you a really nice, quick, at-a-glance view of where your key risks are. Once you have this data, do your concrete experiments. Do some spikes, some tracers, create a walking skeleton. Get that first version out there that doesn't do much, but it tests your whole CI CD infrastructure. That's exactly what we're trying to do here. So, to wrap up, how much design should we do? How much upfront design should we do? Turns out this is a really hard question to answer. You'll get people say this I'm good with maybe a day for a one year effort. That might work for them. It might not work for us because they have more experience. We have less experience. We're building something complicated. They're not. So again, you can't use numbers of days as a guideline here. So let's flip this on its head. Let's say, well, when do we stop doing upfront design? Stop when you understand your significant driving forces. And this is the stuff Todd was talking about earlier. Scaling and performance and security and the other qualities. The constraints of the environment also count into this. You understand the scope and the context of the thing you're building. So basically, if you can draw a context diagram, you're in a good place. You understand your significant design decisions. So you understand your key tech choices, your modularity, whether you're doing microservices or monoliths. You have a way to share this information with other people. So again, create a good bunch of diagrams that you can show to people and have meaningful discussions, get some feedback. You think it's going to work. So you do dry runs over your architecture. You make sure your significant features, stories, use cases, even if they're not fully fleshed out in detail, you think that's going to be supportable. And you've identified and you're comfortable with the key risks. <laughs> How do you do this stuff? It turns out there's millions of things out there that you can use. Event storming, impact mapping, customer workshops, interviews. You've got my C4 model for diagramming, UML for diagramming, Archimate for diagramming, OOAD as a decomposition technique, and DDD. And, and there's lots of stuff here that we can use. And these are the techniques I think we should be teaching people. Some are a bit heavy, like you know, ATAM, architecture evaluation techniques, but some are quite light touch. And I think there's a bunch of interesting stuff here that we can put in our toolbox and pull them out when we think they're necessary. So what I'm trying to do here really is some upfront design to create a starting point and set that direction from which we can then do evolutionary design. 
People say, how do we do this? My, my key advice is go do some carters. You don't need me to do this. Ted Neward, Neil Ford have a bunch of architecture carters you can find online. Create yourself a safe space, a couple of hours in a workshop. Here are some requirements. Go to do some design, draw some pictures. And then you use the outputs of that carter for assessing design, doing architecture evaluations, reviewing diagrams, lots of different things you can do here. So this is a, a super easy thing to do uh, when you get back to the office. My closing advice is just adopt an agile mindset to this as well. Take all those techniques and practices, put them in your toolbox, and when you think they're useful, pull them out. Try them. If they don't work, inspect and adapt and go from there. Something I said earlier is that I'm going to stand here for a bunch of time and I'm going to say a bunch of things, but they're things I've not spoken about. For this reason, and as a thank you for coming along, as an, an, as an early Christmas present, if you go to this URL, you can download my books for free until the end of the year. So more stuff, that's where you go. Thank you very much.